Talking Heads' 1980 album, Remain in Light, took the band's conventional method of writing and recording songs and flipped it on its head. It's an incredible album whose influence reaches far and wide. And today, we're talking all about the writing, recording, and the influences of this timeless album. Hello there, it's Warren Hewitt here. I hope you're doing marvelously well. Welcome back to another episode of the series. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you hit the notification bell, you'll be notified when we have a new video. Of course you can, if you're into production, go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. In January of 1980, Talking Heads were on an unofficial break. They returned to New York City after touring to support their third album, Fear of Music, and decided to take some time off as a band. Frontman David Byrne began working with producer Brian Eno on what would become a separate project, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts. And keyboardist Jerry Harrison produced an album for soul singer Nona Hendrix at the Sigma Sound Studios branch in New York. Meanwhile, Talking Heads bassist and drummer, married couple Tina Weymouth and Chris Franz, considered leaving the band. They felt that Talking Heads was becoming nothing more than a group to back up frontman David Byrne. So, unsure of what to do, Franz and Weymouth headed to the Caribbean for a two-week vacation to consider their options. Here they had the opportunity to practice native percussion instruments and meet the reggae rhythm duo Sly and Robbie. After this trip concluded, France and Weymouth purchased an apartment above Compass Point Studios in Nassau, in the Bahamas. This is the studio where the Talking Heads had recorded their original album, More Songs About Buildings and Food. Soon, David Byrne joined them, followed by Brian Eno. Even though Eno had worked with the band on their previous two albums, he was reluctant to work with them again. But upon hearing a demo tape of what they were working on, he changed his mind. Talking Heads and Brian Eno set out to write and record what would become the 1980 masterpiece, Remain in Light. On this album, Talking Heads took a different approach in their songwriting. Instead of thinking of the group as a singer and a backup band, the goal for this album was, as Burns described, sacrificing our egos for mutual cooperation. So instead of the band writing music around David Byrne's lyrics, they instead decided to begin with instrumental jams, building songs around the best parts. Talking Heads were inspired by a more communal way of making music, integrating polyrhythms from Africa. The 1973 record Aphrodisiac by Nigerian artist Fela Kuti was a particular inspiration. Talking Heads began recording in July of 1980 at Compass Point Studios. Brian Eno played a critical role in this process as they began to blend African musical influences with rock, encouraging experimentation along the way. He compared this creative process to looking out to the world and saying, what a fantastic place we live in, let's celebrate it. So the band began experimenting, recording long extended jam sessions and singling out the best parts. Rather than focusing on chord progressions as you might do in rock, Talking Heads kept it to a relatively simple musical form, focusing instead on layers of polyrhythms. These were the days before looping audio was a simple task that you could do with a computer. So when they found a few bars they liked, they would single them out and then record themselves playing just those parts over and over, keeping it simple so they could build the track from there. David Byrne described this process as turning themselves into human samplers. This use of a longer, simpler, 
jam orientated song is something Talking Heads had experimented with on the song I Zimbra from the album Fear of Music. But this was just the starting point. Eno had the band repeat this process over many times, trying to get the band not to worry too hard about what they were playing. As Jerry Harrison recalls, we had gone down to the Bahamas and were setting out to do an album that we hadn't attempted in the past. We did this because we noticed in our rehearsals that sometimes the first time you play a song, you do it with this instant sense of expiration. And that's different than you'll ever play a song again. We wanted to see if we could capture something like that. So we laid down the parts one person at the studio at a time, with the general mindset of, oh, I want to try it. There were lots and lots of tracks. We used the mixing board as the composition to move from part A to part B. We were really on a roll. We worked three weeks in the Bahamas, ACDC was in the next room doing Back in Black, and we cut all of our basic tracks at the same amount of time they required for one guitar solo. We were really in a groove. Right from the beginning of Remain in Light, this combination of loops, extended jams, and polyrhythms is on full display. Let's take a listen to the opening track, Born Under Punches. The heat goes on. While this unique creative process did create some incredible music, it could also be frustrating at times. Engineer Rhett Davies left the project, upset with the fast-paced environment Eno was having them work in. Stephen Stanley, who had previously worked with Bob Marley, stepped in as engineer in his place. Talking Heads were aware that the world was in the middle of a musical shift. Sugar Hill Gang's hit Rapper's Delight was released only a year before, and hip hop was on the rise. Talking Heads' own drummer Chris Franz had provided the backbeat on the Curtis Blow song The Breaks, and Franz had shown the song to David Byrne. On the song Cross Eyed and Painless, Byrne could be heard emulating Chris Blow's percussive delivery. Most of the instruments were recorded at Compass Point Studios, with additional recording taking place at Sigma Sound in New York City, where Harrison had previously worked. Byrne and Eno began tweaking the songs that they recorded in the Bahamas, adding musicians like Adrian Ballou on guitar, Nona Hendrix on backing vocals, and trumpet player John Hassel. The song Houses in Motion features John Hassel predominantly. His unique avant-garde style perfectly matches the rest of the production on this album. When it came to writing the lyrics, David Byrne was suffering from a bad case of writer's block. He felt that these were incredibly unique songs and needed lyrics to match, so he took an approach similar to how the band had recorded the instruments. Byrne began to assemble lyrical phrases, pulling inspiration from a variety of sources, like news headlines, radio preachers, and even John Dean's Watergate testimony. 
This lyrical technique can be seen in the album's best known song, Once in a Lifetime. This song was almost abandoned, but after Brian Eno developed a wordless melody for the chorus, David Byrne wrote the words in the same manner as the rest of the album, combining phrases from various sources. For this song in particular, he can be heard imitating the vocal delivery of a preacher. Rhythmically, while the band felt beat one in one place, Brian Eno felt it differently, interpreting the third beat as beat one. This was something he encouraged to give a different feel to the song, emphasizing some different rhythmic elements. As Eno remembers, this means the song has a funny balance with two centers of gravity, their funk groove and my dubby reggae-ish understanding of it. A bit like the way Felakuti songs have multiple rhythms going on at the same time, warping in and out of each other. A Lexicon 224 digital reverb effects unit was utilized on this song and album. It was obtained by engineer and mixer Dave Jordan, and it was one of the first of its kind. Once in a Lifetime showcases this reverb, unique rhythms, and Burns' preacher-like vocal delivery. It's all a great example of how Brian Eno encouraged musical experimentation in the studio. As Jerry Harrison recalls, Eno had taught us to think of the studio as an extension of the instrument you had. If you look back at the photos of the Beatles engineers, they were wearing white lab coats. They were totally behind the glass. You didn't go in there. The musicians were in the other room and captured by the technicians. Maybe if you were lucky, they would play the music back through the speakers. Eno broke that barrier down. Everything was an instrument. It was all taking place. When I described my keyboard wash in Once in a Lifetime, it was a performance by me and Eno in the control room being captured. Because we had a trusting relationship with him. We were all cool with that. And it also meant that we began to become familiar with all of the equipment in the control room. This cut and dry role between the musicians, technicians and producers started to become more fluid. Now let's take a listen to all of these experiments combining on one timeless song, Once in a Lifetime. Remain in Light was mixed in August of 1980. Half of it by Brian Eno and engineer John Potoka in New York City, and the other half by David Byrne and Dave Jordan at El Dorado Studios in Los Angeles. Remain in Light was released in October of 1980. And while the album did okay commercially, the influence stretches far beyond any sales numbers or charts. The album has made multiple best of lists by publications like Rolling Stone, Enemy, The New York Times, and Pitchfork. While Once in a Lifetime has become perhaps the band's most popular song. It failed to break the Billboard Top 100, but it did get lots of plays at the famous club Paradise Garage, courtesy of the resident DJ Larry Levin. This expanded Talking Heads music into the New York dance club scene. In an interview I did with him from 2015, engineer and mixer Dave Jordan remarked about how working with Brian Eno was always an incredible experience. And Brian Eno showed me that it can be anything. You know, I, I work with so many people that say, it has to be this, it has to be that. And Brian Eno showed me it can be anything. I was doing an overdub one time with Brian Eno, and he was playing tambourine, and we come in and listen to the playback, and he kept having me rewind the tape to a certain point, and I said, what are you listening for? And he says, I tap my foot on a certain beat. And it was like the 18th beat in it or something. And he wanted to then put a part on that beat. And I thought, you know, that is pretty, that is pretty <laughs> cool. You know, I mean, this guy, this guy is not thinking like I am. I was listening for mistakes or listening to sure. tambourine sounds. And he's on a whole other wavelength. Talking Heads went on to release more songs and albums throughout the 80s. But Remain in Light is perhaps their Sgt. Pepper. 
In 2002, Talking Heads were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And in 2017, Remaining Light was recognized by the Library of Congress for preservation in the National Recording Registry. As David Byrne recalled, we were listening to African pop music, such that was available, like Fela Kuti and King Sunny Ade, and some field recordings, but we didn't set out to imitate those. We deconstructed everything, and then as the music evolved, we began to realize we were in effect reinventing the wheel. Our process led us to something with some affinity to Afro-funk, but we got there the long way around. And of course, our version sounded slightly off. We didn't get it quite right. But in missing, we ended up with something new. Over 40 years later, Remain in Light is still just as incredible and influential an album as ever. A timeless album that should be required listening for all musicians, songwriters, and producers everywhere. Thank you ever so much for watching. Please subscribe and check out the other videos in the series. If you're into production, you can go to producelikeapro.com, sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. Thanks ever so much. So long, farewell, au revoir, adios, adios, goodbye. <laughs>